I'm going to introduce our today's first expert, Professor K. M. Sharif. He's an English professor at the University of Calicut, Kerala. He writes in Malayalam and English and translates among Malayalam, English, Hindi, Gujarati, and Tamil. His publications include Ekalavyas with Thumbs, Cries in Wilderness, the first selection of stories of Narayan, the first Adivas writer published in Malayalam in English translation. Kunupattama's Tryst with Dest Destiny, the first study in English of Vaikom Muhammad Bashir's fiction. Professor Sharif has always been kind enough to engage with National Translation Training Program. With this <coughs> short introduction, I now invite Professor Sharif to deliver the lecture on the topic Translation in the Digital Age. I warmly welcome you, sir. Thank you for this brief introduction. Uh, <coughs> good morning, everybody. This is my first online lecture at CIA. Uh, I, I, I've been a regular visitor to your place, uh, but uh, because of the pandemic, I'm now uh, talking to you of online. So, uh, I, in fact, I have discussed this uh, topic before. Probably uh, there are a few more inputs this time, uh, which would be useful to you. So uh, this is what I'll be doing. I'll be talking for about 50 to 50 minutes plus, And the rest of the time can be devoted for uh, queries, suggestions, comments, whatever you think of saying. And then if I'm to react to any of those, I'll definitely be doing that. OK, so let's go right into the topic. When we are talking about translation in the digital age, uh, we are we have to start at a time when uh, the digital age was just taking off. That was in the late 50s and the early 60s, when people were experimenting with uh, machine translation or computer-aided translation. Computer-aided translation, I think, is the more precise term. So it was a very ambitious project, as you know. Uh, talking about languages as uh, a collect as collections of structures. So uh, in the late 50s and early 60s, when uh, machine translation took off, it took off in the sense of just begin. It's not. It, it, it has never come off well. That's what I'm uh, trying to put across. So the idea was that uh, languages are collections of structures. Okay. Uh, which can be identified and programmed. Programming language, this was the idea. Okay. Now, uh, it, it, it was very popular at the time. Uh, it was believed that the entire, any language in its uh, totality could be programmed. That all you have to do is to uh, look at the algorithms, the rules of translation, apply them digitally, and you get a very precise translation. Okay, now this idea didn't work out for a very obvious reason. Okay, so what I'm trying to say is, uh, have you ever thought of this? Have you ever thought of the fact that what you study is grammar? We have all looked up grammar, and most of us are uh, language teachers. Uh, even if we are not, we have looked up grammar at some stage in our education. So, what do you think is uh, the kind of the discipline called grammar doing. Have you got a complete picture of your language? When you come across uh, strange structures, when you come across strange questions, okay, uh, have you, uh, uh, is grammar able to give you a uh, plausible answer? Yeah, quite a few things. So, for example, why do you have uh, what is called collocation. Okay. You can simply say it comes from usage, but it's, that is not an answer. There might be underlying reasons why you can collocate certain words and not certain other words. Okay. Why, for example, can you uh, you say a big problem, okay, but a huge uh, mountain? Why? Why, why do why do these two different terms, big and huge? 
uh, collocate with the different terms. Is there an underlying reason? And when Chomsky talked about transformations, are, are all the transformations available to us? Are there vast areas which we are familiar with, with but we, we haven't uh, kind of analyzed? These are big questions. So that, there lies the problem. You don't have a complete picture of any language. As you go on using language, you discover this. And you also discover that there are fuzzy areas. Like, for example, when I say uh, the laptop uh, I was using broke down. Okay, No problem here. All of you would say that this is a perfectly grammatical sentence. But if I say the laptop broke down, which I was using, yeah, some people would frown on this sentence. They would say that you have to uh, insert this uh, phrase in between. The laptop which I was using. Broke down. So uh, there are many such. I am giving you a very obvious example, uh, which underlines the fact that it's difficult to program uh, language. So uh, people continue to believe in its uh, efficacy. Okay, you can see the screen now. Yeah. So <clears throat> in the 60s onwards, and its objectives were not realized for precisely this reason. Okay. You cannot program everything. You cannot program every single aspect of language that you so that you can expect to get precise translations. <coughs> collocations are one. You can't, uh, you can't program all the collocations. I am coming to another uh, related area a little later. But for the time being, uh, let this be there. Okay. But uh, machine translation or computer aided translation is good for something else. What is that? Limited translation. Yeah. You have a limited number of sentences, right? Uh, which uh, can be translated. Very useful for uh, announcements at airports, railway stations, uh, other sim uh, simpler forms of communication. This program, you can simply uh, click on the source text and the target text appears, or even the target text. Uh, converts itself into speech, text to speech. Yeah, this is also another kind of transition, text to speech, even within the same language. Remember, uh, Roman Jakobson talked about uh, intralinguistic translation. Okay, right. So, this is a, another example, probably, of intralinguistic. Remember, they have the medium changes, right, within the same language. You speak out something, the text appears on the screen. Uh, you type something on the screen, the machine speaks. Right. So this is okay. And so far, uh, machine translation is useful. So if you want to discover, if you want to test my uh, statement, you can simply do it on uh, Google Translate. You know, you can try with any of the Indian languages. Okay, Hindi, for example. I did it with a write-up on uh, Thomas Hardy. Okay, and it is so funny that I had to stop typing further. All those bits of information, where he was born, or what, what were his uh, first works, etc., etc., his background. So uh, it's it's not basically a problem of uh, programmers. Yes, of course, you could say programmers face a problem. You cannot come up with a perfect time. But try any European language. There are about 28 languages used in the European Union, which, of course, includes English. Now, uh, try your luck with any European language and you'll definitely find that my statement is validated. You know, uh, there are umpteen number of problems. Okay. And try typing a sentence used by, let us say, Shashi Taru in recent times. Uh, not, not just the bombastic uh, terms that he uses, but some terms of expression he is very fond of. Try that. And you'll find how uh, inefficient, I'm using the word uh, inefficient in inverted commas, how inefficient this whole business is. But yet very efficient when you think of limited uh, languages or limited translation, a set of uh, pre programmed phrases, words, phrases, okay, texts, announcements, okay. Uh, Posters, whatever. 
you have a you have a fixed number of words, a very familiar set of phrases, sentences, and the machine will automatically translate. Very simple. Okay, and perhaps a little advanced uh, translation also possible within limits. Okay, but uh, we shouldn't underestimate what uh, a machine can do. Let's move on to the next uh, interesting uh, category. This is called translation memory. Yeah. I think all of you know this. What uh, translation? It is basically a, this, a dictionary come thesaurus. Okay. You have a uh, you have it online. That's all. Okay. And uh, you can you can simply uh, click on the word that you, it offers you a translation. And uh, let us say up to tra sentence level. Okay. Translation memory. Just a, uh, a collection of. Uh, linguistic structures, words, phrases, etc., that you find programmed into the computer. Okay. Now, this is not very different from uh, what I just talked about, machine trace. But wait a minute. You're going to see something else. You're going to see a proposal. It has not yet become a reality. It's still in the uh, making. Transition memory can be uh, programmed in such a way that it's a growing corpus. So what does that mean? That means it is an open uh, site where, uh, like uh, Wikipedia, for example, anybody can edit it. Of course, the uh, the edited portions will be uh, supervised, examined by a board of directors. This is exactly what's going to happen in this proposal for a new uh, growing corpus of translation okay so how, how does this happen actually okay uh, imagine uh, we are about 20 people here so uh, i uh, in i begin work here let us say there are language pairs you have uh, a, a particular section for translation from malayalam to english or English to Malayalam, another for uh, Hindi to English, English to Hindi. So it works in pairs, remember. And of course, at a larger stage, uh, although I'm not aware of the mechanics, how that happens, you can have, or you can integrate all these. Okay. So I I start translating. Okay. Yeah. The for the NTM, uh, this is a very useful uh, kind of uh, program. Okay, I, I don't I don't think they have started it, but definitely the NTM can think of starting something. It is a multi-crore project. It has to first to get approval, and then a number of people, techies as well as translators, have to work on it. This is just a proposal. All right. So I I work on this. I start translating uh, a work like, for example, the complete works of Ambedkar. Right. I start with the first volume. Uh, I work on this book for some time. Then I switch over to something like uh, God of Small Things, Arundhati Roy's novel. Okay. All the what what happens when I start working uh, on uh, my translation? Uh, for the time being, it'll have a small built-in uh, memory, right? Just a few things. So. When I uh, see this, uh, I think you can see the dialogue box, right? If you can't see it, tell me. Okay. So what you find on the right under equivalent are a set of equivalents for the English word half. Okay. You have a set of equivalents. So actually, originally this was in Malayalam, but for our convenience, uh, you can't read it here. That's very convenient. You can imagine these in your language. Okay. So how many words do you have for half in your language? Okay. Depending upon the context. Uh, many, many languages have more than one word. Okay. So this is a word-to-word -word, uh, equivalent stage. Right. So you have the word half here. You can change this word. You can think of words like, uh, like for example, um, uh, incomplete, a word like incomplete. Think of the equivalence 
you have in Hindi or Tamil or Kannada or Urdu, whatever language that you are using. So when you type half, all these will appear in the menu here, right? Okay. And you choose one of these, A, B, C, D, right? Now, if you are unsatisfied with your choice, you think, uh, none of this fit, what do you do? You coin a fifth one. You have four uh, options here. You coin a fifth one and type that into your box. Okay. And what happens? This gets uh, embedded here in the program. So when the next person types the same word, half, so I, uh, I finish my work, I log out, I go away. Somebody else logs in and types uh, half or incomplete, whatever word that you have here, you get instead of four, five options. The word I coined enters the corpus, right? So this goes on growing, okay? So this is what you have at the world level. You can think of other levels. Uh, yeah, this again, another word, uh, idiom. You have uh, something like not on good terms, okay, or uh, not see eye to eye, well known, idiom, okay. So what are the possibilities that you have uh, in your language, okay, bantanai for in Hindi, or any other term that you can think of, okay. In Malayalam, I, I identified four or five for this. So some of these would be idioms proper some of these would be phrases okay like uh, or simply uh, what what we call uh, um, uh, quick uh, off the cuff remarks that people make right so instead of not on good terms you have these five equals again if you are if you are able to locate uh, another uh, phrase for this, you add that here. So the next person gets six instead of five, right? So this is one uh, element here, just going on adding things. You can introduce hypertext here, for example. Uh, see, out of the way. For the phrase out of the way, one, two, three, four, five. And on uh, five, you find this uh, asterisk, and it is explained below. Okay, like for example, it is slang, or it is from dialect, particular dialect, a non-standard. Uh, all these are relative terms. I'm using just, just uh, for convenience sake, right? So uh, point uh, the uh, option number five, equivalent number five belongs to a particular dialect or it is just like this is shown here okay wait a minute the the wonders do not end okay uh, i have made a conquest this is actually an intertitle or a subtitle that you find in uh, what was that philip city lights charlie chaplin city lights and for those who have seen the film might remember this. This is at, at the very end, where the flower girl gets her sight back. Okay. And our hero, he is trying to, he smiles at her. And she believes that he is a total stranger. Normally, she identifies him by, with a touch. Yeah. When she touches his hand, she knows who it is. Now, he is at a distance smiling at her, and she believes that this is just a, he's just a roadside Romeo. And she makes this remark to her uh, relative or friend, whoever stands near her. I have made a conquest, meaning he has fallen in love with me. So here, uh, at the bottom, you can give a hyperlink to uh, uh, this Philip, City Lights. Charlie Chaplin's film. And you find, uh, you'll find this uh, sentence there. Remark, I've made a conquest. These four are the options that you have in your language. Whatever uh, options they, 
uh, you have in your language. Okay. Uh, and you can add a fifth one, sixth one, whatever. But you have a hypertext here. Here, it will be uh, marked with an asterisk. Okay. And uh, leading you to uh, this film, Charlie Chaplin film. Right. So you see. So And you can uh, lead people to pages from text. You have uh, digital copies of text available online. If it is possible to link up your choice to those texts, such as, for example, a phrase from uh, a well-known writer, Graham Chant's, some uh, phrase or word or sentence which Graham Chant uses in this fiction. Okay. And you have this hyperlink here. If you click on that, it will take you directly to Graham Chant's text. This all these are possible. Now, uh, what I have to emphasize here is, all these are possible with a very, let us say, uh, tremendous kind of plan, in which uh, institutions like CAL, uh, the government, state or central government, and other official or semi-official or non-official institutions and organizations are involved. Massive plan with a massive server, okay, which can hold all these. But I'm telling you, this is possible. I don't have any doubt about that. It's possible. It's possible to have something like this. And virtually, it's a kind of new, it, it functions like an alternate neural network. See, when you, are, when you read something, you are immediately reminded of something else. Okay. When you say, when you say, for instance, that uh, he is an IR, yeah, there are lots of defections in Indian politics. So actually, uh, this was the name of a person, okay, way back in the sixties, okay, who defected a number of times back and forth. So somebody asked him, "Ab IRM hai ki gayaram?" So this kind of connections that you make from your personal memory. Is simply replicated here. Okay, that the app tells you or this uh, site tells you where this expression can be located, and you go there, get it, right? So this is a very ambitious program, and which is yet to be realized, but worth keeping in mind. Now, uh, translation into and from sign language. Yeah, how is uh, digital technology involved? I think you've seen uh, sign language being used. Let me see if I can. So what happens here is, uh, in uh, sign language translation, of course, uh, you, can, you, can, uh, you can simply sign in front of a computer, camera. Okay. The uh, program will convert it into... Uh, text, okay, and uh, vice versa. Okay, if you are speaking or typing into the uh, computer, uh, it'll. Uh, if you are speaking into the computer, it'll convert it into sign language. So it's available. So what we have to remember here is when we are talking about sign language, it's not a very. Uh, it's a, it's not a simple language as uh, different from uh, our natural language. So many people tend to think that there are no tenses in sign language. You must, you'll be very quickly disillusioned if you look up any book on sign language. Not only tenses, but aspects can be signed. Okay. You can say things like, uh, I have never been uh, looking into this okay. aspect. Uh, I have never completed a full program in my life. Uh, aspect, past uh, participle. All these can be signed into. And there are uh, as many signs as probably words. Okay, and new signs are being formulated all the time, like new words. And you can sign uh, at different 
points in the air before you. You can sign here. Okay. This would mean something. And when you raise your uh, hands and sign here, okay, it would mean something else. So the possibilities are endless. Okay. So it's, it's a complete language in every way. And people who use sign language will tell you that. As complex as natural languages. Right? So uh, this facilitates a number of things, such as, for example, uh, people who are uh, challenged, uh, vocally challenged people, can still be good teachers. We only got to look up uh, YouTube to find uh, vocally challenged teachers uh, addressing their students. Okay. Uh, the interesting thing is that uh, in such cases, a lab which they have with them can probably help them uh, uh, understand what the teacher is speaking about. Okay. And uh, in the process, of, in the students are encouraged to learn sign language also in America. There are a number of institutions which have uh, vocally challenged teachers teaching the students in sign language. So what a computer does is you can sign before the computer and the computer will convert it into natural language and vice versa. You can speak into the uh, computer, it will convert it into sign language. Okay, and of course you record it. See, what, what I'm doing now, I'm speaking to you. And if there are uh, people, vocally challenged people, auditorily challenged people in the audience, what, what I do is I simply have this whole presentation recorded. Okay. And then send it to the uh, to CIA. And they give it to the uh, students. Okay. You have the whole lecture in sign language. So I don't know if the system has advanced so far, but it's possible. It's possible. I'll show you the clip afterwards. Right. So uh, these are these are this is another uh, area in which uh, digital technology can intervene. Okay, and uh, you know uh, facilitate. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm coming to another area which is for uh, people who are visually challenged. As interesting, probably more interesting than this. Uh, if, if I fail to play the clip now, I'll play it at the end. Right. Uh, yes. Subtitling, uh, of course, is uh, one of the most familiar uh, use of digital technology in translation. Right. So uh, I, I think you are aware of two different types of uh, subtitling methods. One is the titles are embedded on the screen. Okay. The other is that the subtitles are simply turned on. You know, uh, I use the chat box. Uh, you have this. Uh, a word uh, program. I think it is uh, not word. You do you use Notepad? Okay, and save it in a particular way that uh, when the uh, file is kept in the same folder as the video, and when you open it, it is automatically visible on the screen. So this is easier one can say you can even translate one set of subtitles into uh, another language you have you have subtitles available what, what are the files called I've got srt files yes srt files yes. srt files are available on the net you get them easily for any uh, popular film so you, you can play them you can uh, while when you play the video you can uh, open the keep the file open, and the subtitles will be displayed on the screen. No problem. The other one, embedding subtitles, this you have to do using uh, various programs, with video maker or some uh, plain uh, video editor. Uh, 
quite a few. Uh, of course, the uh, more advanced ones are available. But all you do is you place the subtitle at a particular point in the on the screen. So, say from 52 seconds to 55 seconds. Okay, and probably you can have uh, fractions of seconds also. 52. Point five. If it is, it is possible, where the subtitle quickly runs on. So embedding subtitles, once you embed them, they stay on the uh, screen. So uh, digital technology here comes in in a big way in how you uh, frame the rules of uh, your subtitles. So there are a number of, uh, I mean, well-known uh, factors. One is the size of the subtitle, it must be readable. Position of the subtitle, it shouldn't intervene with the videos. It should have, it should be properly synced. Meaning, if somebody says something, the subtitle shouldn't appear after five seconds. Whole thing goes waste. No. Just to be synchronized. So when I am saying this, uh, okay, when I am saying this, you can, you should be able to find like this. So what I'm typing here when I'm saying should appear on the screen exactly when I'm saying when I'm saying. Right. So this kind of sync is very important. Color is important. What color uh, the subtitles are. Size of the font. Okay. And your uh, option to move the subtitles up and down depending upon uh, where, uh, which part of the visual is very important. You know, so somebody drops a coin on the floor and the camera is focusing on that. Okay. Or if instead of focusing on that, the camera simply stands still in uh, one of the two ways in which uh, people make uh, films. One dash is one thing, the other is uh, in-depth uh, screen. Okay. The camera stands still and picks up everything. Uh, from uh, middle distance. So when somebody drops a coin, the subtitle shouldn't uh, intervene with that area. Okay, you move the subtitle up. Instead of subtitle means titles which appear below or down. So here you move it up, while uh, you can uh, the audience can see the audience can see the coin on the floor. Okay. Right, let me show you a subtitle. So just. Tell me if you can make sense of this. is very important. It should be continuous. It should make sense. Let me see if I can switch down. Wait a minute. Mm. Uh, these two are the uh, common uh, forms of subtitling. Embedded subtitling and uh, uh, editable subtitling, which is the SRT file. You keep the file open and uh, the subtitles are visible on the screen, which you can edit. Okay, you can you can uh, take the SRT file available of uh, subtitles in some language. You can add subtitles in your language, your target language. Remove the earlier subtitles, and the file will be intact. Okay, the only problem is you should get good subtitles, SRT files. Sometimes the or original subtitles that you get would be very seriously problematic. Such as in an Iranian film, uh, there's a, a taxi, Jafar Panahi's film. You can uh, you see a taxi driver saying that uh, I, I simply appropriate. Okay, <laughs> actually he's a pickpocket. He's not a fraudster. He's a pickpocket. So somehow the translator got it wrong, and the mistake was carried over to an indirect subtitle. Uh, which was made from this English version. Okay. So people who knew the language pointed it out. Yeah, this is uh, the chat simply means that he's a pickpocket, that he's not a fraudster, so on. So you have to be careful. The only thing is you have to be careful when you are uh, dealing with uh, uh, available, already done subtitles. Right. Okay, dubbing, you know, uh, the uh, importance of which people don't realize often. You can have two types of dubbing, that also, you know, full dubbing, 
and their uh, conversation is uh, dub and partial dubbing or voice so when you get only the gist of what is spoken and making you aware that this is only a, a partial dubbing or voice over it's that's not the real voice you are hearing destroying the illusion of uh, reality that you have when full dubbing takes place okay so uh, here again syncing is something which technology has to take care of lip sync proper okay if it shouldn't overlap into the next uh, dialogue it shouldn't uh, overlap into a silent area on the in the a silent moment in the film it looks so bad like awkward that shouldn't happen and uh, technology is uh, and in partial dubbing or voice over technology is involved in other ways too like for example you must retain the original voice in the background you hear uh, the voice at a very low level okay much below the uh, voice so and occasionally it can be raised while uh, the voice over continues at some point the original voice which was at a low level can be raised and lowered again and at the end of the whole uh, clip the original voice can be brought to life again it it can be alive at the beginning it can be alive at the end and in between the voice over rules okay yeah this is what i was telling you about audio description okay for the a uh, visually challenged what exactly is audio description uh audio description as the term uh, tells you is a description of a visual okay it can be a, a single a still from a film it can be a an event a small event okay like somebody entering a room okay now what is important about this form of uh, adaptation or translation whatever you want to call it is that uh, the narration can go up to three times the normal speed you know so probably uh, of ordinary people people like us who have uh, sight i don't know if there are any visually challenged person in the audience but for people who are not visually challenged uh, speech which is delivered at more than the normal speed will fail to register you know that when when a, and the old kind of uh, tape recorder when the tape gets damaged you know runs at a faster pace you hear kera 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 nothing no nothing becomes clear to you uh, but for visually challenged people most visually people challenged people i know have told me that they can take in speech at uh, nearly three times the normal speed so what is the advantage of this the advantage is that you can put in more descriptive material suppose you are watching a film uh, you are watching a walt disney uh, film for children okay you have uh, okay so if it is animated let us say you have a number of things on the in the frame okay normally when the film is running it's not possible to describe them all okay suppose uh, i i have the audience before me right okay i have the, i have, i say that i can see 52 others here on the screen 52 others i can see the names of several people i can see something in the chat box i can see uh, uh, greetings in the chat box i can all these when you when i have a very limited kind of uh, vision before me but suppose you are sitting in a proper classroom i am at ca in a room so i i take a look at you i have uh, a a large number of i can see a large number of things only a few of which actually actively register in my mind but a visually challenged person can take in much more information so i i describe your dress 
I describe the room. I describe what's on the wall. I describe the pictures. I describe the switches that I can find on the wall. I describe the furniture. I describe the whole ambience. And suppose I, when I deliver all these at three times the normal speed, it's possible for the visually talented person to get a feel of what is going on. So imagine this happening. I tested it with my uh, students, two of them, two of whom uh, were visually challenged. So they tell me this is perfectly all right. And uh, probably the government can insist on filmmakers uh, producing a version for the visually challenged. So, for example, if you want to certify a film, it should have this version available, okay, on demand. So imagine what this will do. Imagine what uh, the additional audience um, uh, Bollywood will get. Okay, uh, even there are uh, hundreds of thousands of Hindi-speaking people or people who can understand Hindi uh, who are visually challenged. So it's an additional market for the filmmakers. So probably, and, and it, it's also a matter of uh, social justice, okay. making available something uh, to the visual agent, which they were not uh, in possession of. Okay, I tried this. I, I mean, the process of completing a full film, which fortunately doesn't have copyright. This is experimental, the 1953 film, uh, Neela Queen. Uh, I'm not I'm not completed it yet. I'm in the process of doing it, and uh, I'm taking the help of people who can speak very fast. You know, I can't do it. Okay, I know as a, a person who speaks at a normal pace, probably a little faster, uh, but not fast enough for uh, a an audio description aimed at the visually challenged. So this is a wonderful thing. Okay, and once it gets uh, applied. Once it is done on a large scale, you can uh, definitely feel the impact that will make that it will make on uh, people who are visually challenged. Right. And uh, by the way, I should also remind you that a radio running commentary of a game, a match, uh, most uh, importantly, a, ma a fast paced match. Cricket is a slow game. Take football or volleyball. Volleyball is the fastest game. Okay. There's always action on the ground. Okay. Now, uh, you can take a running commentary as an audio description, which uh, not only the visually challenged, but people who are not watching the game, either uh, directly or on TV, can uh, use. You, if you have seen that film offside, the Iranian film, Jafar Panahi's film, Offside, uh, you'll see how important a radio running commentary is. Okay, where uh, television is not available. Okay, if it is well delivered, you get the feeling, feel of the game. A good running commentary always tells you about the ambience, how the field looks, the sky, it's going to rain. So, uh, for all, or not, not just for visually challenged people, ordinary people, like people who have sight, get the feel of it. You have a uh, wonderful. Uh, case of, uh, let us say, faithful or uh, very vivid, dynamic adaptation in the running commentary. So what else do we have here? Yeah, I think I've uh, come to the end of the various ways in which digital technology can be used in uh, translation. And... Uh, uh, do I have anything else to add? Yes, of course. Uh, in uh, a digital age, uh, all, all these forms get go on uh, getting uh, transformed as newer technological innovations come. Okay, uh, I left out one uh, mode which was popular at one time, but it is probably uh, not so popular. Uh, you know, what is called real-time subtitling. Okay. Real-time subtitling is uh, something, uh, is what happens when somebody speaks 
uh, in a language which the audience does not understand and the computer converts it into uh, the same language text and the technician immediately provides a subtitle very complicated you know but it works the subtitles have got to come at a tremendous pace 80 60 to 80 words a minute and uh, they have all kinds of shortcuts uh, if you press a group of keys say three or four it would give you not just four letters but a sentence some uh, codes like that okay which 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 would help the uh, technician to type in the uh, subtitles but uh, i think it has gone out of vogue now because as soon as somebody says something it can uh, the machine itself can convert it into uh, uh, first into text and then from text into text in the target language okay with minor intervention from the uh, technician once upon a time in Britain, this was very popular. What is called real time subtitling. So I have just given you an overview of uh, what technology can do in translation. Okay, more and more uh, advances are coming, especially in audio description. I think even before audio description came on, uh, subtitling uh, took on uh, a, a slightly different term. Earlier, only uh, speeches, the dialogues were subtitled. Now, if you if you watch any uh, movie on uh, over the top OTT movie, you will find that they are very meticulous about subtitling. For instance, they find you'll find that things like small noises in the background. If there is a noise in the background, the subtitle will say uh, a noise in the background. If there is a child crying, faint sound of child crying, you'll find such things on the screen. If there is a monument which the audience is not familiar with, okay, like for instance uh, the grand, uh, not a monument, monument or landscape, the Grand Canyon in uh, Colorado, America. Okay, we don't know what it is, but the subtitle will tell you uh, Grand Canyon, Colorado. Okay. Thank you.